Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Friends and listeners, and welcome to episode 12 of season 8 of the Thos Hermes podcast. Today is Sunday, May 15. Well, that's the day of release of this episode, and my name is Rudolf. I am the creator and host of this op- uh, podcast, of this show. I was going to do this opera. Well, that was a back. Uh, slash in old years. Um, right, and I'm also now the creator of Kai Kobad Radio, and I'm saying this because I would like you to have a look at that. Um, I admit that the website for Kai Kobad Radio is still not ready. I mean, you can go on the website and you find the link to listen to that radio, um, and you will also find that link on the Thoth Hermes website. So I'll give you those two links. Uh, the link for Thos Hermes is, as most of you know, T-H-O-T-H-E-R-M-E-S dot com, Thoshermes dot com. And for Kaikobad Radio, it is radio dot Kaikobad dot com. That's radio dot K-E-I-K-O-B-A-D dot com right um soon you'll find that more easily i promise it's just some work and i just did not have the time to do it it's great to have you all back here and thanks to those of you who come here for the first time for a great episode once again here on the source hermes podcast where i will speak to lovely thea Wersching from los angeles also known for some of you under her name Pluto Babe. Well, that sounds a bit funny, but that's her name by which she goes as an astrologer. And she's a very interesting and very good astrologer. We will talk about that, but more about her and what we talk about in a minute when I introduce her in the interview. So what's new uh, else here? Well, not much. The show is going well and radio is steadily coming up. You might want to know what Kaikobat Radio is all about. Well, Kaikobat Radio is a 24-7 radio channel on the internet where you can listen to the best um, podcasts and other similar content. Talk radio, it is uh, content from the world of the occult and the esoteric Western tradition. So there are Colleague podcasters like Occult of Personality by Greg Kaminsky or Whence Came You, the famous Freemason magazine on, um, on the internet. Or you have also, for example, the talks that Mark Stavish is doing uh, with his guests in the, inter- in the Institute for Hermetic um, Studies. So you have that's just an example. Um, you have many, many different things. Each week we have two eight-hour loops there with changing programs. So 16 hours of uh, diverse programs each week. And so you just turn on whenever you think you want to. You go on that link and you listen to nice talk shows. And... Um, of course, there is also some music in between, a little bit at least, right? But it's mostly a talk radio, right? So why don't we talk about your feedback on both of that? I love your feedback and uh, I will invite you to go on the website that I mentioned before. I mean, the Thos Hermes website. There you can find voicemail to send to me or there is also a contact form and Beyond all that, you find, of course, all the previous episodes and all the show notes to those previous episodes. A lot of information by now. We are approaching 130 episodes. Wow. And, um, well, it's, it's, uh, it's a huge um, 
resource for everyone there. Uh, you can find a lot of interesting links and information on our guests and what they represent. And uh, yes, um, it would also be nice if you became a patron, if you are not already. Thank you to all of you who are already patrons and who are supporting this show. But, you know, it still amazes me. It's a little, little number of people who really make this possible for, by now, about 4,000 people every week who listen in. And um, I think some more of those 4,000 should be aware that this is a question of solidarity, um, that not only such a small number pay for this to happen, um, because that's what the Patreon site is for. It's not for me and making me a nice living. I have my job, but it's for making this happen, these episodes happen, all the episodes happen, Thought Hermes happen. So thank you to those who already do support us and thanks to those who decide now, well, I should do that as well. Patreon.com, look for the Sauce Hermes podcast or just go on the Sauce Hermes website and find the Patreon or the donation button there. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. So now some music. Of course, you know that we always play music on this show, always three pieces of music. And um, I've often asked people, like, you know that, and I do it, of course, also today, to send me their music, to let me know what they do in kind of esoteric type of music. And so, uh, well, I got two of you guys um, this week again who came up with it. So um, that's nice. And the first, and of course, the other one, we will hear his music as well in a later show. So, But the first um, gentleman, Joshua Kirch, um, he wrote to me and he says about his music that it's a mix between ambient electronic music with a lot of early music influence and inspiration. And um, he is studying via the great Quareya, the great Quareya course. He's studying magic and the Western tradition. And uh, he's a listener and a fan of the show. And he sent me tracks from his music to play here on the show. And that's great. I'm very happy about those supports on that end as well. I find his titles of his, of his songs funny because... Um, uh, Cloudy Skies is the first title, the one we hear now. You think of Cloudy Skies immediately, but no, it's always a little a little thing in the title that is different from what you hear the first place, and that makes me think. It, it's lovely, esoterically influenced music, so Cloudy Skies is first by our friend and listener and fan Joshua Kirk, and we should become fans of his music now. And we listen to Cloudy Scries. Enjoy.
cloudy skies. No, 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 not cloudy skies. Cloudy skies by Joshua Kirch, one of our listeners and musician, composer, and he is offering his music for this show. Thank you, Joshua. Um, it's great to know about you and to hear your music, your wonderful pieces here. Thank you. So, Thea Vershing. Thea is my guest here on this show, and um, she's from Los Angeles. And to be honest, it was her good friend, I believe, um, uh, who pointed me towards her. And you might guess who that is, Tamra Lucid, when we spoke in January here on the show. Then after the show, she said, you know, you should have a look at what Thea does. And she was right. She was right. Uh, well, the first off thing that comes to your mind when you when you look up Thea and her work, you find that great American Renaissance tarot we are going to talk at length about. A tarot deck, another one you say, what is American Renaissance? Others might say, um, well, American Renaissance is a literary name. That's why this episode is also subtitled Literary Tarot. It's, a, it's the literature that was created in the early 19th century in the U.S., um, with many, many important names. And we are I'm not going to talk about this now because you're going to hear all that in the interview. And this American Renaissance Tarot allows you to search your inner dimensions while discovering the U.S. esoteric history. But I must say, um, you know that I'm European. And yes, 85% of our listeners here are from North America. But um, I really must say I have learned an awful lot to... Uh, by looking at this tarot and by talking to Thea about this subject, because, of course, um, we over here on the other side of the Atlantic, and I'm sure the same is true for people on the Southern Hemisphere or everywhere in the world where you're listening to us, you don't know so much about that. So let's learn again about that. Occultism, esotericism is all about learning new things every day, isn't it? So... Um, Really, really interesting. But she is also an astrologer, and we also talk about that. Um, her speciality, if I might say so, is evolutionary astrology. And also here, I I know about astrology. It's not my best knowledge that I have. I know other things better than the astrological part. But I really, really learned a lot uh, from this talk with um, with Thea and what she has to say about that and all the philosophy behind you know, astrology. Highly interesting, and I'm glad I can present her on this show to you. So, without further ado, I want to go and meet Thea with you. Take this intro a little bit shorter here today. And uh, I will come back in the middle of the interview, basically after about 36, 37 minutes, We'll come back and we'll play more music by Joshua, more music by Joshua Kirch, who is our featured artist, musician here on this episode today. And, um, well, let's move to Los Angeles and meet Thea Vershing. Here comes the interview. It was a few months ago that uh, somebody pointed me to a new tarot set. And, you know, there are many tarots around, but this one, um, I really, as a European especially, was puzzled even by its title because the American Renaissance tarot, the term American Renaissance is not exactly something that as a European you are familiar with, even though literature and it's a lot about literature we're going to hear that soon um, is something that um, uh, i know a little bit about but i wasn't really familiar with that and um, so i delved a bit into it and i'm very happy tonight to welcome well the author of the american tarot but not only that we will hear much more about her and about her work uh, it's a great pleasure thea thea Bershing, to have you here on the saucer Hermit podcast with me tonight hello there Hello, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me. 
Uh, isn't the internet wonderful? You can speak to someone over in LA and it's just like if you were in my living room. So that's, that's great. Thea, um, yes, that's the way we, we got to know each other about across that American tarot, American Renaissance tarot, sorry. Um, but I wouldn't like to start with that. I would like to start with you as a person first, if that's okay. Um, and we come then later to the tarot because there are so many things things that I discovered about you. Um, maybe you can let us know um, you work as an astrologer, you work as a tarot reader, I believe as well, but astrology is, I think, your main, your main path. Um, so divination is something that you practice. Um, but when I saw your website on the first page on the philosophy about that, I think you said many, many very important things. Maybe we can start with that and then we talk about you, how you came to all that. Sure thing. So which one do you want to start with? The philosophy or the how philosophy? Came to yes. It? No, the philosophy okay. first, because I think it's important to settle that and to pin that down somehow. Sure. So that's really easy to address because I would say in my astrological career, it's probably the one area in my life where I really feel like I belong to a lineage. And so I trained with Stephen Forrest. And if you know his work, he's just incredible. He's an incredible teacher. And having sat in many, many workshops with him, getting training, he can just beam out complete sentences and articulated ideas for eight hours at a go. <laughs> and he's quite wonderful. So he is one of the pioneers of evolutionary astrology. And the principle there is that we all reincarnate multiple times. And so when I'm looking at someone's chart, I'm not doing simply the descriptive thing, which is, I think, how a lot of people understand astrology, that it's exactly. a sort of flat description. If you have this position in your chart, you own this thing and you are this thing. And uh, Stephen's approach is much more that it's kind of a blank slate that you get to fill. So I don't want to say blank slate, but more like um, these categories of potential and you get to decide the manifestation of that particular archetype, how you want to fill it. And so I think of the chart as a kind of lifetime homework assignment. And so we are always in process with it. There's no static descriptive component. And so uh, a lot of people know sun sign astrology, but even that sun, which is so core to who we are, I think of that as uh, a cup we're going to fill in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. We don't automatically have it. We co-create, we participate <laughs> with these potentials to become that thing. And then um, particularly with evolutionary, we do a focus on the past life inheritance. And that's not simply to navel gaze and be excited that you were Cleopatra in a past life or something. It's, it's funny. It's everybody was Cleopatra. <laughs> nobody was their slaves. <laughs> sure. Right, right. I never do um, those celebrity readings. It's extremely yeah. rare yeah. Um, because most of us had very uh, mundane or familiar problems in a past life. And I look at how those might be hanging around. Mm. And so we come in marked. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you have children, but if you spend any time with children, you see that they all come in as their own thing already. It's difficult to imagine that a child is a blank slate, right? They, they usually yeah. come in with particular inheritance. So it's just about unpacking the past and then uh, reaching toward the future destiny, which astrology articulates as the south node is the past life inheritance and the north node of the moon is the karmic destiny, what you're reaching for. Except for the, the astrological terms that you were just using, that reminds me very much about, A, you just said it, karma, about Eastern mm -hmm. philosophy on one side, but also about psychoanalysis at some point. Because when you talk about the slate and, and about that you come in with preconception somehow, that's very much the concept of Jungian, at least, analysis, right? Absolutely. And I'm also thinking of Rudolf Steiner a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because well, we, had um, him, we had him a lot on this show lately. It's never the subject, uh, but almost every time the, the, my interview partner brings him up. Yeah, that's interesting. Maybe, maybe it's your name. <laughs> but, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, my kid was also recently accepted into a uh, Waldorf school, and I have done some training in Waldorf education, which right. is, of course, founded by Steiner. Um, so that is what we learned. And they use terms. Uh, they don't use the terms that Jung used. They actually go back to the humoral theory 
course. to describe the different types of children, and they talk about a choleric child or a melancholic child. Mm-hmm. Exactly, and it was it was previous to 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 Jung also mostly. The first, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. Now, interesting. Uh, so. Um, it's not fatalist. It's not prediction astrology for you. It's something that is gives you a scheme that you, as you say, you have to fill it out. You have to be active in it, right? Yes, uh, it's a dance like anything. And so I think of it as the meeting point between fate and free will. So to say there's nothing that's ever fated or meant to happen, I wouldn't go that far. And I don't think any astrologer would. Mm. Uh, but you know, at least in this practice, our focus is always on the power that you do have um, because you do have so much choice and so much freedom. And so that's right. definitely the emphasis. And that's also very important because otherwise you 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 make your clients, your dependent of you if, because you can kind of guide them if you don't say that, if you don't leave them that liberty. Right. And uh, Absolutely. So uh, I, I know you're interested in finding out a little bit about me. And I think something that has been so formative to my character is that I was in a cult like therapy group for about seven years. So this is really foundational to who I am. And I bring it up now because the power dynamics were so abusive And so I was really subject to this idea of um, I know more about you than you know about yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm the educated one. I'm the trained one. Mm -hmm. And so you can't argue with me about your own experience. And so I really take that uh, negative situation into my work as a counselor. And I never want to be in that position with someone. So if I'm saying hey, I think you could move in this direction with the astrological archetypes. It looks like this is what your chart is is saying to me. And my client doesn't like that. And they have a lot of resistance. I would never be in that (laughs) position of saying, well, you have to Mm -hmm. listen to me. It's your destiny. I see something you don't see. When that happens, I step back and say, how can we reimagine this archetype or what's a way you might fulfill it uh, that feels better to you? So I think of it very much like a, a co-creation. Right, um, right, yeah. right. And like, like a good doctor who, if he wants to heal the patient, the patient has to heal him or herself, right? It's not, yes. it's not, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit <laughs> same, the same idea. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, you could, uh, before we come to your life, because there you built the perfect bridge with what you just said about your back, uh, your past uh, background. Um, but before we go into that, maybe you could help some people, because I know many people out there who practice occultism um, are often taken aback by people who don't believe in the stuff, you know, and especially astrology is often because people think of astrology being that what they read in newspaper horoscopes, right? So they say, well, this is all stupid and yeah, you can't predict things. And that's exactly going into that direction that you they think it's all about prediction. What would you, somebody who is not an experienced astrologer like you, but somebody who practices, but has to practice astrology as part of a more uh, a, a larger system maybe they work as like, a part of a curriculum exactly yes. <laughs> and how would you help them to defend astrology let's put it that way towards those people who just throw it away so i would say this is a huge issue within astrology and has been since there was such a thing as uh, pop astrology or newspaper astrology right so we're looking back at the 20th century and now it's even more heightened with the internet and internet astrologers So I'm in the unusual position of uh, not being a big fan of astrological marketing because I feel like the the way that pop astrology is presented, it's not how most astrologers actually use it. Mm. So I am not addicted to the daily motions of the planets or I don't stop what I'm doing because (laughs) Mercury is retrograde or something like that. Uh, So I'm much more interested in these uh, longer epochs of the planets, right? So these Mm -hmm. big cycles. Um, But the the catch here is that I'm also part of an astrological community. And so many of my friends who are astrologers, they do that thing that we call fishing, where (laughs) they're fishing for people who are interested in the full moon or the new moon, Mm -hmm. or they're saying, oh, Mercury's retrograde, tune in and I can help you. Yeah. Right. And uh, even my teacher, Stephen Forrest, I think he just put something out about this because he's uh, creating an app. Mm -hmm. Right. So even Mm -hmm. Stephen, who does this deep, soulful, psychological work, 
understands that to communicate with the public, you probably have to start with something that uh, is um, like the kindergarten version of what the art is. Right. So I would just say, you know, take some solace in the fact that professional astrologers aren't addicted to the moon cycles or whatever seems sort of dumb <laughs> about astrology. And I mean, this happens to me a lot socially where I meet someone and they say, oh, I'm a Taurus. Tell me everything about me. And I'm just thinking, like, what are you talking about? I would never try to do that. I'm not judging you. I'm relating to you as a human, not what your sun sign is. So I, I think there's just a lot about the perception that doesn't match the reality. But it, it's a problem that won't go away right. because to advertise it, we have to maybe present it in a dumbed down version. Yeah. <laughs> and it serves. I, I, <laughs> I don't use that 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 word seriously, but it serves the enemy, so to speak. Right. Because it's, of course, something that you can easily make fun of because it is uh, superficial. Yeah. 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 And, and I might be a bit of an odd duck as well in that um, I'm not interested in what's called mundane astrology, which is predicting worldly events. Mm. And that is what most people understand an astrologer to be. Right. They don't think of it as, you know, a counselor helping right. you through exactly. you know, archetypal issues. Exactly. So I refrain from doing that. But I think for that reason, I'm not as much understood as an astrologer at mm -hmm. all because my emphasis is counseling. So y you call yourself the Pluto babe as a, as a, as a, <laughs> how does Pluto play an important role in your life or in your past or in your work? Oh, absolutely. So that was actually a nickname that I acquired in the Stephen Forrest group. So that name was given to me. And it's because I was always pushing the envelope in the class discussions. And so I wanted to know about things like suicide or eating disorders or mm -hmm. uh, these more intense states that I had lived through. So um, my own background is that I lived through some pretty horrific abuse and struggled with mental illness because of that. And so I found my own experiences were very intense. Mm. And that, of course, was reflected in my questions in class. Uh, but it's proven to be a good marketing technique because it allows other people to find me sure. uh, who have lived through these more intense things. And then I'm able to help normalize those situations. Um, so, for example, you know, rape and sexual abuse is much more prevalent than we like to imagine. Uh, but I'm a good person to talk to about those things because I have a very trauma informed perspective and I've done my own healing work around that. Hmm. So I think there's just some, some comfort in finding that having gone through these Plutonian experiences, which represent the shadow portion of a human life, you're not marked, you're not a bad person. You're not evil. I think that we um, imagine we might be these things if, if bad things happen to us. Yeah. Right. But just kind of understanding that maybe we have some deep psychological work to do. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I see something, of course, that people who are listening to this podcast do not see because I can see you here on my little video screen. And on the back of the wall, I see on the left the chakra tree, so to speak. And on the right, uh, I see the, 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 the sephirot, right? Um, if mm -hmm. they are up, they are set up in a way. So I think it must, it, it must be that. And um, how much is that passage between East and West important in your in your work or in your personal practice? Oh, this is a fun question. So, uh, <laughs> yes, my, my office is very colorful. Uh, <laughs> so the, the chakra poster, interestingly, it's a kind of a, a very local thing in the sense that uh, when I was 19, I was in my progressed new moon phase. Some astrologers out there might get that. Uh, but I went to Sedona with the first time with my mother. So again, here I am in California mm. and in Arizona, there is um, sort of a metaphysical hub of a town called Sedona. Yeah. And so I got that poster when I was 19 and it was the beginning of a spiritual journey for me. Right. Uh, so that's really what that poster means to me. That's how I use it. And then uh, my wonderful friend, Amy Hale. Uh, put out oh. um, Ithil Cohoon's Deck Out of Intelligence sure, with yes. Folger. And uh, I, I have actually never really succeeded in understanding Kabbalah, 
but I really believe in the power of images. So I thought, what if I put these in my room and just mm-hmm. had this sort of like passive <laughs> images working on me? Like maybe something would happen and some doors would open for me. So yeah. you've you've hit upon a really wide gap there. Okay, in- <laughs> okay. Well, I just, it just hit me that to your left this and to your right that, you know? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Uh, yeah but Amy, of course, she was on this show as well. And then we had, uh, had a very nice talk. Well, it's already a year and a half back. Time flies. It's amazing. Mm. Um, so, see, uh, we, you have now hit a little bit on your on your personal background. Um, as much as you wish to go there, of course, uh, I don't want to push too hard on that. But um, how did you come not to astrology alone? But uh, I think you have come to something that's more than that, if I may say to some, how do you call it? Is it spiritual work? Is it esoteric work? Is it occult work? Um, what, what is your, how would you define your path and how did you get into that? <laughs> I, I don't know how to define my path, but I could just give you um, a quick overview maybe of all the directions. So I did become a born again Christian when I was 14 and that okay. was actually the beginning Uh, because, you know, I was a pretty fierce, unhappy atheist up until that point, a suicidal teen. Mm. And then all of a sudden the spiritual world opened up to me in a big way. Stabilized you in a way. Oh, I was, you know, I was spending hours a day in prayer. I mean, Mm. I really (laughs) did. Did it come from you or did that come from your surroundings or parents or something like that? Hmm. Um, well, so uh, my father was very anti-religion mm. and so uh, he was very upset that I was involved in this religious group. And I would say, um, again, I can link it to astrology in that when folks are about 14 and a half, they undergo the first Saturn opposition. And Here so we, again, are, we, struggled, we have children. We struggled Steiner again, 14 <laughs> Ex- is, is exactly that crucial date as well. Yes, that, mm. that, no, that's absolutely right. And he talks about that. So you undergo a dark night of the soul at this age, and it's important to do that underworld work. And so uh, for me, you know, how that age was marked was really having a profound spiritual experience where I felt that when I was praying, I could direct my reality Mm. and I was spending hours and hours in prayer and meditation. And then eventually I realized I didn't have to do that under the auspices of Christianity. So I experimented with being Wiccan and attempted to join covens and things like that. Uh, And then (laughs) Egyptology, um, sort of ancient Egyptian religion really erupted into my life, not by choice, but by a lot of synchronicity. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was in Germany, actually, at a a German language program in Munich, and I was at the little Egyptology Museum in Munich, Mm -hmm. and there's a statue of Sekhmet there, and I was just really knocked over. I mean, I was just completely brought to my knees, and a communication happened, a transmission happened, Mm -hmm. and I did not even know the name of this deity, and so I had to go look it up later, and I kind of forgot about it for a while Uh, And then what's interesting is that my academic work actually opened up a lot of my occult education. And so it started with astrology because uh, I I wound up graduating college, but in, in training as an astrologer, but I felt like it sort of wasn't enough, like neither path was enough. So how could I bring them together? And so in my English program at the University of California, I thought, how could I study astrology? And so that study of astrology, the history of it led to uh, the study of hermeticism. Mm -hmm. And so that was something I started to undertake. And so um, (laughs) so simultaneously, while I am studying hermeticism in my academic program, I, uh, I had other visitations from Egyptian deities. So I had these, you know, appearances that were very dramatic. And because I had spent so long uh, in counseling and therapy and getting to know my own mind, it's, I, it was very clear that this was not a mental illness. It wasn't like a mm. unwell hallucination or delusion of grandeur. It was something else. And so through communicating uh, with these energies, suddenly I found that I had this academic grant money that just appeared in my uh, account. And then I was able to travel to Egypt and wow. uh, <laughs> go with the group and, and visit these temples. So... I think I have just tried to patch up uh, my belief system as I go along. It's very 
uh, what do they call it? Like kind of cafeteria style, a little of this, a little of that, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I'm in some way a cometicist, you know, interest in, uh, ancient Egypt is big, but so much is also defined by my astrological philosophy as well. So yeah. Is your astrology, um, defined by the ancient classical system of the seven of the seven planets so to speak or is it the larger the larger astrology the modern astrology that you practice yeah i i love modern astrology and so definitely my lineage is from 20th century psychological astrology right. that's where Which my roots are all planets etc yeah, yeah 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 exactly and uh, i like the fact that astrology is applicable to the times that we're living in right now. Right. So since we have the technology to discover Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, etc., I feel like that's relevant. And I do particular work on a planet named Ceres, uh, which was discovered in 1801. Mm -hmm. And um, this planet is also classified as a dwarf planet like Pluto. Right. And I think it has a lot to say to us at this time in our life. And I, I think there's been astrological interest in Ceres simultaneously with the recent NASA mission to Ceres to learn more about it. So, right. Interesting. We had an interesting talk about that with, with John Michael Greer lately also. Um, mm. This new book on Pluto and Ceres also came up, of course, in that, oh, in that fascinating. discussion. Oh, Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll have to follow up on that. That's yeah, great. yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, okay, so you mentioned your, your studies, your academic studies, of course, um, and they are, I believe, in mostly American literature, right? Yes. Yes. So literature, so literary science is your, is your, is your academic work. Could we say that? Correct. Yeah. So, um, I have a doctorate in English and I was doing cross-disciplinary work, but as I'm sure you're familiar, there are very few academic homes for the occult. Oh yes. And, uh, what's funny about my story, I went to UCLA, but I actually did get into a religion program in Santa Barbara, And, you know, it is well known as, as for its religion program. But I thought, well, I don't want to live there because it's a smaller town. So I wound up staying in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. but then making my project really about um, the history of occultism in America and its literature and how those things dovetailed. And so uh, the dissertation is a lot about the American Gothic and how the Gothic chronicles a lot of these alternative movements. So, for example, in the first chapter, I talk about one of America's first novel novelists, Charles Brockton Brown, and he was a writer of horror fiction and he has many, many Illuminati novels. Mm -hmm. And this is so interesting to me. I wish more people knew about this because um, they're quite wonderful. So he he has many illuminated magi characters Uh, who are able to awaken the people around them. And, and a lot are of are we talking about the early 19th century when we talk about him or, or? Uh, 1790s, 1790s, 1790s but, but definitely yeah, but after, late, late. after the Bavarian Illuminati had taken place, so to speak. Correct. So um, the Bavarian Illuminati was defunct. Hmm. However, there was a lot of fear um, based on, I think it was Robeson. I'm not mm -hmm. remembering the name of the book, but it was mm -hmm. the expose. Yeah. And so the expose of the Bavarian Illuminati actually caused a big anti-Masonic yeah. panic yeah. in the United States. And yeah. so um, Brown is really playing on that. But, but what's funny is that a lot of these texts that are... Uh, the anti-texts, you know, like telling you how terrible these uh, these groups are, they create interest in readers because that's the only way to find out about of them. Course, right? so, of course, of yeah. course. But that, that has happened a lot in the history of the occult that actually starting with Jamblichus uh, um, that we know uh, or with even with the Gnostics before that, that we, we know more about, uh, through their enemies than through themselves, right? <laughs> yes. So, so what you're naming, um, I think, does dovetail with my work somewhat in that a lot of these novelists, they are navigating that issue where they want to talk about these occult ideas and they're very excited about them. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're also having to pretend to be critical okay. of the irrational. So yeah. they're doing these kind of uh, feints uh, to <laughs> cover their tracks. Yeah. yeah. We were coming in that more in depth in a moment. Before we go there, I would like to talk a bit about tarot. On your uh, mm -hmm. astrology website, one of the menu points next to astrology is also tarot. So how much does the tarot 
in not not the American Renaissance theory coming into that later, but the theory in general. How much does it play a role in your personal work, also in your divinatory work, and um, mm. what is it for you? Uh, well, it's such a big question; it doesn't have a, a simple answer. Take your time. So. <laughs> I, I think that just from a young teenager, I was using oracle cards and uh, my mother is an artist. And so we grew up with a lot of occult ephemera in the house. Mm -hmm. So um, my mother is an art teacher. She had like, you know, books of astrology that were mm -hmm. mostly visual. And there were packs of tarot cards around because she liked how they looked. So she was not teaching me anything that they contained. But I grew up with those images. So um, and then when I made that Egypt trip, I mentioned it happened to be the tarot intensive tour of Egypt. And so uh, Mary Greer was on that trip. Oh, this right. is just all coincidence. And so at that time, uh, tarot opened up to me in a big way. And then um, I think just through creating a deck of my own is when the archetypes really began to live for me, that I could see them in the outer world. And I was reading uh, Alejandro Hodorowsky's book on the tarot. So of course, he's a lifelong student of tarot. And while I was in the midst of reading that book, I just had this complete vision of what my tarot deck would be. So I, I know you don't want to talk about my tarot deck yet, but I, I do think it was like sort of living these oh, archetypes sure. no, no, I don't want to in writing them by all means but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just wanting to know in general what tarot means to you but mm -hmm. yeah so now it's um now it's really an obsession to the point that uh in a couple of weeks there i'll be teaching a class on my two favorite tarot novels one is by charles williams and one is by tim powers and i think those novels model the way that i use tarot And so they both kind of have these um, occult techniques loaded into the form of the mm -hmm. novels. Mm -hmm. So I've been really like <laughs> living and breathing tarot for the last several years here. So, so, so you get those two novels for our listeners uh, that they can write it down. And I will also make sure that it's on the on the show notes of this of this episode. But maybe you just can say those two novels once again. Yes, I, I would love to introduce them. So uh, The Greater Trumps by Charles Williams. Mm -hmm. And some folks might know uh, Williams as an English horror writer, uh, but he was also a student of A.E. Waits. So he was not in the Golden Dawn, but mm -hmm. Waite had a Rosicrucian group following his involvement with the Golden Dawn. And Charles Williams worked very closely with him. Okay. And uh, apparently there was much crossover between those groups. And so right. uh, Charles Williams is invoking a Golden Dawn understanding of the tarot in Greater Trump's. And they're also using the cards to work magic. And so in one notable scene, uh, people are shuffling the cards. It's this deck that I think is supposed to be like the Sola Bus Busca. So something oh, when you right, look at sure, it, it's yeah. kind of horrifying or like just really impactful. And so by shuffling the pentacles, the earth cards, they're actually able to create earth in their own hands. And so there's a lot about, you know, directing the weather or, or making these elemental storms mm -hmm. with the cards. Uh, and there's also a kind of, um, I, I do think Williams is really leaning on Carl Jung in that there, there are these dancing archetypes. That's sort of the core of, of what this deck is, right? There are these archetypes that have their own life. Mm -hmm. And then um, Tim Powers, the novel is Last Call. And Last it Call. Takes mm -hmm. Last Call, yes. Mm -hmm. And it takes place in the 90s. I love it because it's set in Las Vegas. And so the whole thing is this kind of meditation on odds. And so uh, Tim Powers has really done his homework. It's a novel about tarot, but it's also a novel about poker and playing cards and, and sort of like how to game. That's where uh, the name the comes system. from. So, yeah, 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 yeah. It's so much fun. And uh, it's just loaded with numerical symbolism and studies on randomness and it's a meditation on divination and how it works and right. so um the, the characters are just always engaged in reading the signs it's obsessive and and that way i really relate to that novel last call so everything <laughs> okay. is a sign and has some hidden meaning and it's a lot of fun so when you're saying that and when you're relating to those novels that shows us that you and that finally portrays you that you that you seem to be very holistic um 
let me call it occultist. Uh, I, I, I don't like the word esotericist because it's been abused so much by, mm. by as you say, pop culture and, and that. Um, so by, you, are, you seem to be very holistic, uh, have a very holistic approach to all that world, haven't you? Oh, thank you. I take that as a compliment. I know other people identify me as an occultist, but I'm never sure what that means to them. So, I, yeah, well, of course, yeah. you have to be careful. That's why I explained it. But, but um, yes. I don't know a better word and that explains it better. I think Western, the Western esoteric path is a kind of a euphemism for occultism because you ha you don't want to use the word because it sounds dark, but it isn't to me at all. So, so, so. Oh, sure. I, I really embraced it in my academic work and partly because it is scary, uh, because I think that uh, if you are using these techniques, you can change reality and it's unsettling. That's so, why you do it. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. You just mentioned academic work, and that brings me to a question that I like asking people who are academics like you and who wrote like you work about the occult in there in their in your dissertation but also other people in other books etc i know from many of them that they are very shy about mentioning that they are also practicing um, which is kind of weird it's like if a theologian wouldn't be allowed to have a creed because that <laughs> that might make him um, unbelievable somehow. Um, but um, in in the field of occultism, esotericism, it's it's a hard thing. Um, how did you experience that? How did you experience the fact that you were in an academic career writing about your cult and maybe people knew that you were practicing or they didn't, maybe you hid it from them. How did you deal with that? I experienced just uh, incredible prejudice. And mm. this is part of why I am not in the academy anymore. All right. And so because you uh, chose or because you weren't <laughs> allowed to. Well, um, I, I was really making these earnest attempts to be cross-disciplinary because, of course, the occult is a pretty homeless discipline. Mm. I don't think it should be. I think it is a coherent tradition spanning, you know, several hundred years, mm. not, you know, millennia. So I think it should have its own home. But uh, I was not meeting any uh, friendly homes and religion departments at UCLA. The, sure. the religion department there had kind of dissolved. But I was told that this was not a religion. It was magic. And so going all the way back to, who was it, Fraser? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it just was so outdated and so ridiculous. And so um, I was not really able to pers pursue study of it as a religion. And then the person under whom I was working uh, was not familiar with people like Jung or Crowley. And, you know, these were not on his radar. And so um, the lengths he made me go to prove that this was worthy of academic, academic study were really extreme. Um, and I had one professor on my committee who uh, is a Ficino expert. And he right. said, why, why is she having to prove all of this? This is part of our cultural inheritance. Right? <laughs> and, um, but for whatever reason, this is the hand that I was dealt. And I had experiences like speaking on that uh, Illumina Illuminati pan panic that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then someone approaching me after the conference and saying, are you a witch? And that sort of thing. And um, I got back channeled information at one point that I had lost out on an academic job because I was considered too close to my subject, which is to say too sympathetic. And so um, I think now because things have changed so radically. So I finally took my degree in 2012. And um, just to kind of give you the astrological uh, overview on this, <laughs> since 2012, things have really exploded since Neptune went into Pisces, right? All of a sudden now everyone's interested in metaphysics and astrology and these things are going more mainstream, uh, but they were not at that mm -hmm. time. Um, so I forgot what I was going to say, but yeah, I, I did not have a good time of it. And even though all my peers were very, very interested, mm -hmm. I felt like the, the people sort of in positions above me, um, this, this was embarrassing to them that I had this fascination with the occult. And it meant that I was unscholarly because I refused to criticize it. And I, I was not endorsing it either. I was doing that kind of, you know, academic reserve, but because I refuse to criticize the practitioners of the occult as irrational, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and you know the <laughs> flimsy thinkers or something then then i was considered yeah. too sympathetic to the ideas okay yeah well it's something that i hear on, for example somebody i don't know if you know patricia mccormack if that's a familiar figure to you she's i think she's australian she she was on the show here as well and she is in oxford of all places uh, mm-hmm. and she dresses up in a completely goth style and witchy style extra i don't know how she does it but she gets uh, she gets through with it but she's a rare exception i think she must be a very strong personality on that end as well because she she just does oh, it sure. you know? yeah, yeah, yeah no i yeah. <laughs> i'm happy you brought that up actually because i think this is sort of where it, it dovetails with my astrological perspective yeah because i know other people who had very positive experiences mm. and they didn't meet that resistance and yeah. then other people have these kind of ironclad personalities who are able to withstand the critique or Whatever, just have so exactly. much self-confidence. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, but, on the, uh, but I think that what you experienced is something that you, that, that the majority of the academicians who would be interested and practice uh, would experience. I would, I would, I would, uh, at, at that time, it, it was common. And I agree with you in that um, as a trained academic, it's very easy for me to bring my academic mind to that work and not bring my own sympathy into it, you know, the same respect we would give to anyone who was, you know, practicing a religion. So exactly. And now it is time, as always on the Thoughts Hermes podcast, in the middle of the interview, it is time for a musical break. Thanks Tia for that first part. We will be back shortly, but now we are going to listen to another piece by our friend and listener Joshua Kier here. And this piece is called Periphery in context, another esoteric ambient music, but combined with ancient music styles and sounds. Um, I really find it a very exciting and interesting mix. So periphery in context will be this second piece that we hear, after which we will go back to Thea and have uh, our second part of the interview. We go more in-depth in all those questions that we were already rising in the first part. I think you're going to enjoy that. And when we're done after the interview, then music is back and the third piece by Joshua will be played. And this third piece is called Raised Permanent. Raised, not right, raised, R-A-I, but raised, R A Z. ED, raised permanent. I told you he likes those little puns with the sound and the pronunciation of words. Very, very funny. So, um, yeah, well, as again, periphery in context, after which the second part of the interview with Thea Bershing, followed by raised permanent, and then I will be back to talk to you what's on next week. Okay. Enjoy Joshua Kirk's music.
Let's now finally go to our American tarot here. So um, American Renaissance tarot, maybe at first, even though 85% of the listeners here are North American, um, but still American Renaissance might not ring a bell with everyone who is not so familiar with literature, or it might even ring the wrong bell because I believe at some point some very nationalist movement also claimed that name, American Renaissance. We are not talking about that here. Um, so we are talking about a movement in literature um, that... I think uh, occupied lots of the first part of the 19th century, if I'm not wrong. But why am I talking? You should. You do please explain American Renaissance to us. Yes, I will explain this. So uh, in the 1940s, I believe it was, a literary critic was looking back on the 19th century and said, hey, there was a big explosion of talent in the mid 19th century in the 1850s. And so that was Walt Whitman, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, Henry David Thoreau, Nathaniel Hawthorne. And who am I forgetting? Did I say Melville already? Not yet. So, mm -hmm. Okay. So got Melville, Hawthorne, Whitman, Thoreau and Emerson, right? So that's yes, the five. That's five, yeah. And so that critic really invented this idea of American Renaissance. But then as uh, the English, um, the field of English studies transformed in America with civil rights and women's rights, we then expanded that list and said, well, what about... Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe and Frederick yeah. Douglass and sure. women and, and people of color who, who really belong here as well. And so um, what was interesting to me about this time period, it is very iconic in that uh, we see some hermetic themes coming out in this uh, literature, which is, you know, why it's exciting to me. But also, I think that um, this American Renaissance concept dovetails with the Florentine Renaissance in some very specific ways. And so uh, in the Florentine Renaissance, we have the translation of all these ancient texts into Latin. And so we had the same thing happening in the beginning of the 19th century, but the texts, these same texts were being translated uh, by Thomas Taylor into English. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, uh, English speaking world has access to the Corpus Hermeticum and the Neoplatonists. And so we know that some Uh, English romantic poets were very interested in these ideas, mm -hmm. but Ralph Waldo Emerson in the United States uh, was obsessed with Thomas Taylor and these works that he had translated. And so um, this idea of it being a renaissance in that it's a rebirth of ancient ideas, I think that is uh, what really drew me to the term and why I stuck to American re Renaissance, even though a hate group later appropriated this term. Exactly. <laughs> this is very recent. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you're in the ivory tower, you know, in the English world, of course, when you hear American Renaissance, you think of these writers. That would sure. be your first sure. association. Sure. Yeah. Um, no, but I just wanted to make, mention it because to make it clear, because, because sure. you, never, yeah. you never know. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, Renaissance You said uh, re uh, reviving things that had been part of a past, right? What mm -hmm, exactly mm -hmm. in the American sense now, in the American Renaissance sense, what exactly did they revive? What 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 was the ideas that from back then that they uh, revived? Because American history is much shorter than Florentine history back way in the 15th century, right? Well, I would say this is the, the idea of um, what we might call the Western tradition or right. the Western Hermetic tradition, because in the Florentine Renaissance, suddenly there's an explosion of humanism yeah. going back to these classical ideas from the ancient mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And so I would say um, here with you know Emerson, Emerson is known as spearheading the transcendentalist movement. Mm -hmm. And so that is it's kind of another part of the discussion. Uh, but most people think of transcendentalism as coming from Immanuel Kant because of uh, the, the transcendental forms, right? That's what we think. But <laughs> the Americans did not have access to a good translation of Kant. Um, yeah. So their understanding of him was very limited. And so this is really a Neoplatonic movement, much more than it is a Kantian movement. That's the kind of idealism they're practicing. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. so the, the American Renaissance term to me includes the transcendentalist movement and that metaphysical exploration they were doing. Because the Florentine Renaissance, when the general public thinks of it, is not immediately thinking of Hermeticism and those ideas that were 
uh, taken again from the past, but rather, as you said, humanism and and um, so, uh, independence of religion and stuff like that. And and in the second thought, the only specialists would think of hermeticism and 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 uh, and those things that we like, right? And in the, I mean, I, I think in the American relationship, liter- it seems to be different. It seems to be seems to be more of that, more of the hermetic and and uh, uh, spiritual part, right? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, I would say no to that. Okay. Uh, and I'll explain why. But uh, first of all, I think this shows my bias as a literary person in that I'm thinking, well, this is Marsilio Ficino, right? Like he puts Plato and the Neoplatonists into translation. So that's what created this movement. That's why I said I we, we have like- a focus on that. <laughs> and maybe that's not a general focus on the Florentine Renaissance that most people would have. Yeah. Yes, you're correct about that. And I would say the reason I wrote this project is because I think most Americans have zero sense that there was an interesting metaphysical movement in the 19th century. I don't think anyone associates America with spiritual creativity. True. And so yeah. <laughs> I wanted to write this project to say, well, actually, there were fascinating practitioners and so much uh, like there's so much homegrown, interesting metaphysics here that we can look at. And I, I wanted to change the story there. And so I was taking a familiar term, at least in the literary world, mm-hmm. American Renaissance and saying, guess what? It also has a metaphysical component. Right. So the again, spiritualism also <laughs> spiritualism also part of that. Yes. And so I will mention uh, a book that was very influential on me. So it's um, Catherine Albany's A Republic of Mind and Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's American metaphysical religion. And so what she does is just look at the pastiche of um, all those uh, traditions. And so spiritualism is huge. So that starts in 1848 with the Fox sisters. And so they're the moon card in my tarot. Um, But they, of course, you know, eventually lead to... Um, Madame Blavatsky, right? Like this is sort of uh, how she <laughs> found her uh, co-conspirator and everything. So right. I, I, w- I was wanting to look at like what were the um, seed movements to the later explosion of occultism in the later 19th century. So what was happening in the middle? And then Emerson, even though many people think of him as a secular sage or a bur- boring person you have to read in English class, In his times, he was really thought of as kind of, I would say, the first New Age guru, and we wouldn't have called him that, but he was encouraging people to think for themselves outside of traditional religion. Mm -hmm. And so he did have that uh, that feel, I would say, of a new age guru in his time. So, right, right, and I think that's what you make very clear, and what is important about that. That you also mention a person that, at least over here in Europe, and I don't know at all, George Lippard, right? Uh, for example, yes. he he was. Uh, the most popular writer of his day in North America or in America, as, as you would say. And and he uh, was very much writing about uh, America being a Masonic Rosicrucian invention at some point, uh, yes. to Th- the point that mainly people would, would, <laughs> would copy him. But, he, but even though it was pure fiction, what he wrote there, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so you have said so much there. So how do I drop in with Lepard? Uh, well, so again, I was trying to show all the different strands of alternative traditions. And mm-hmm. so um, there were, uh, I should say, Freemasonry. And it's many, many copycat groups because it wasn't just Freemasonry. We had so many secret and private societies yeah. in the 19th century. Yeah. So it was before television. You know, <laughs> it was, this is what people gathered together to do. Templars, so, very also very popular in North America. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, odd fellows. Yes. I mean, there was even an, an order of, of red men. So I'm doing the quotes there, but kind of um, a, a secret society based on uh, Native American traditions, but only white people joined that society. So I mean, there were just so many. Yeah. And so um, Lepard concocts his own group uh, based on what he knew about Freemasonry and the Rosicrucians, but he combined it with American history. Mm. And so George Washington becomes uh, part of that lineage in his imagination. Okay. And he was uh, pulling from the, um, the the group of the Transylvanian mystic Kelpius, who founded, mm-hmm. um, I guess it would just be like a sort of communal religious society. It was Christian, but had a lot of occult elements in the 1690s. And so Lepard grew up in that area. So there was a lot of um, the homegrown mysticism that he was pulling from. 
But I would say he really invents this idea that America was a Masonic plot. Right. And this all comes out of his uh, brain. So it's <laughs> right, exactly. most of it That's is the funny it's, thing about it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's fictional. And uh, to use another example, we have this Liberty Bell in America, right? Mm-hmm. So the, the Liberty Bell supposedly rang on July 4th. Uh, when the when independence was declared, but that's not true. Lepard made up that story. So uh, the Liberty Bell was actually broken and out of commission during that time. But Lepard wrote such a great story about it okay. and the Liberty Bell ringing that right. So <laughs> he invents a lot of American uh, history and and American myths at the same time, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. One of his more famous stories is that um, an unknown man spoke at um, the at Independence Hall when people were wavering over signing the Declaration of Independence. And so this man gave a speech. It goaded everyone up. It got everyone excited. And so uh, the declaration was signed. And then that man dematerialized. And okay. so uh, Lepard is really implanting this idea of ascended masters, helping the American experiment along. And then this is the story that Manly P. Hall later picked up on and he puts it in the big book as well as some other places. And uh, Ronald, Ronald Reagan ultimately wound up quoting that story about the speech of the unknown and uh, <laughs> it's sort of divine destiny of America. So, yes, Lepard's very fun. And I also like him because he was a good friend to Edgar Allan Poe. Right. And so their friendship is interesting. Well, yeah. Finally, that name came up. Um, but Lepard is also in your tra- Let, Let's Before we go to Poe, let's, let's explain what the American Renaissance tarot is, because we have spoken about it now, but actually it's the 22 major arcana are all personalities of, of, of that literary movement, right? Um, yes, yeah. Then, and in the minor arcana, then you call the queen and the king, of course, but the jack and the, and the knight become the missionary and the pioneer, right? That's, yes. your, that's yeah. your personal touch in that. And also those four uh, minor arcana in each suit, they are literary producers, so to speak, so writers and, and figures of the literary world. So what, what inspired you to do that? Okay, so I had uh, taken the degree, but I didn't really have many job prospects because mm-hmm. <laughs> no one's hiring literary occultists. So that was my situation. And I wasn't sure what to do with myself. And like I said, I was reading this book by Hodorowski and suddenly this complete vision appeared. And so this did not feel like a conscious choice. It felt like uh, something I received. And because I had just been so steeped, you know, for the last decade in American occult history, I had all these stories at my fingertips. And so there wasn't even much choice about who to make, you know, what archetype. And so we have someone like John Brown, who was a convicted criminal and was hanged ultimately for his crime but he was also a a martyr, an important symbol for the United States. So a lot of the the characters just suggested themselves or like Henry David Thoreau as the hermit Mm. and that sort of thing. Or Um, Pascal Beverly Randall for love for number six, for example. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, Randolph's a special research interest of mine uh, and I have an article out with him in the uh, Braille volume on African-American esotericism. Mm. Mm. So... I would say what's interesting about this project, I didn't include every occultist I knew because I thought it would be sort of boring deck if it was all one note. And Mm. so we do have really a range of characters. Certainly. Abraham Lincoln is there as well. Yes. Right. Well, I mean, Lincoln was just such an important symbol. So Lincoln has become like a god, right? Because. uh, Yeah. And and the the opposite symbol is there as well. The devil card, of course. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I'll clarify. Uh, it's it's a pro union deck in that mm-hmm. most of the figures are going to be Northerners, mm-hmm. you know, or New Englanders, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, it's not really fair to the Southern side, but right. because the the tarot did come out of a Christian culture, I did want to keep that uh, sort of evil quality of the devil. I know we like to make him a sexy character now, uh, but I <laughs> I just wanted to bring that materialist quality of the devil. Right. Right. And so um, we have someone who wrote a very racist book um, defending racist science. That's who our devil figure is. Right. But aside from him, I think all the other characters are pretty inspiring. 
And uh, what else should I say? You asked me so many questions. So yeah, well, well, for example, why you renamed um, the, the 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 knight and and the, the page or the, the jack into oh, sure. pioneer and missionary, for example? That that I find interesting. Yeah. So uh, because I was using real people, it felt like it would be insulting to call a major literary figure a page because a page is a child. Hmm. And so that didn't sit right with me. And um, with the knight, you know, it's it's just not a very, I don't know, American archetype. Neither is king or queen, but I, I couldn't get rid of king or queen. Hmm. So a missionary to me is someone who has a lot of zeal. And so I uh, was just choosing writers that had a lot of zeal. So that's what marks um, right. the, the four missionaries or knights in the deck, that they were all very passionate about their political beliefs. And then uh, the pages, uh, they made them the pioneers because they initiated some new genre. And so they're usually originators or innovators in the deck. Mm -hmm. So I, it wasn't much more thought out than that. So I don't Well, <laughs> that's, that's well thought out. And um, yeah. the, the A's to 10, they are books produced or written by, by those figures that are in the same suit on top, so to speak, right? Correct. Yes. So um, I did categorize the suits by genre. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, Poe is really all over the swords genre. Right. And so that's just really about magazine writing or this more, you know, ephemeral writing that became popular in the 19th century. And then Melville presides over the adventure genre. And then let's see, with uh, Cups, Water, we have Harriet Beecher Stowe and Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, because Hawthorne's work on symbol is so good. And Stowe was really appealing to uh, the, the senses. What do they call that? Um, <laughs> I can't think of the word, but she's really playing on people's emotions. So, so she fit in the Cups genre. And then uh, Coins or Pentacles is essentially autobiography, and we feature African-American writers there. Mm -hmm. So um, they're, they're all kind of speaking to different, f different facets of human life. And so that's why, you know, again, I didn't just pack this deck with occultists because tarot has to speak to um, so many facets of your human life. It can't just be one note. So absolutely. So that's exactly the, now the next question that I have uh, a tarot. It charges itself by time also by the use of it by by what we see in it but 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 also by what comes out of it so the names of and the work especially of those people that you that you put on those cards um how does this particular tarot for you and how should it work for others how does it work for you how does it work for others what is the the loading the intention behind that tarot set Oh, that's a big question. Um, so I have two ways I want to answer this. So, you know, number one, it's educational. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's because I had a very elite education. I was very privileged to get this doctorate and go deep into this era. And so uh, a lot of it is just intended to give people a little bit of knowledge. And I'm hoping that little bit of knowledge might open up a big journey for them where they want to go read this novel that I've taken a selection from. So, for example, um, so when you when you have in the book that goes with it, you explain each card with with the person it represents and what their life was, etc. That's that's the educational part, right? Yes. So it's a hefty book. So each card has a chapter of uh, two to three pages. Mm. And so I'm hoping that sparks people to go read some of these texts in the original. And I would say uh, more um, like the more emotional spiritual component for me mm. is that growing up as an American, I felt very ashamed of my ancestry. And I also felt that there was just nothing there, you know, that I just I didn't have a culture or I, I had no lineage. I had no history. And growing up in the pagan world as a teenager, I saw everyone reaching back to England or the old country, wherever they had come from or, you know, an, an imagined Avalon or ancient Egypt or something like that. And I thought, well, you know, my ancestors have been here for several hundred years. What about this place? Like what's interesting about America? And I thought it was unusual that I was an American pagan. I wanted to know how that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, how, mm -hmm. <laughs> how did I happen? And, and so I, I think my process was finding these adopted ancestors in American occultists. So right. sort of looking back and seeing how really interesting and progressive and exciting it was 
and just finding a lot of commonality with a lot of these figures. And um, it's funny, I, I was just traveling in upstate New York and we wound up staying at the former home of the Oneida commune. Are you familiar with them at all? No, no. <laughs> so I was an American free love commune and, and they incorporated a lot of uh, kind of harmonial occultist ideas. And hey, when was that? When did they? I was mid 19th century mm-hmm. is when they were active, um, but they were active for a very long time for this type of group, okay. right? Because these groups often implode. Um, but, you know, they were well known. And it, I mean, it just was uh, so interesting because they had such progressive politics yeah. as well in terms yeah. of the gender balance, you know, the balance of labor. Yeah. So, so I think 19th century America is fascinating. And I think when we are able to reclaim what's positive and exciting and progressive about it, I feel like that is really something that Americans need because I'm on the left politically and I find Mm -hmm. that other people on the left look back at America and and only see the horror show. They only see all of Americans' crimes, um, but there's so much other stuff there that is enriching and that we can be proud of. Otherwise, you wouldn't stand where you stand nowadays. Exactly. Um, Yeah. That's that opens for me a, a question. Well, it's you're not the first uh, person I asked that, but it seems very uh, obvious. I need to ask that to you now. And um, you mentioned the American Renaissance as that movement and that the hermetic texts and the occult texts were very, very much part of that. And um, what, what strikes me often is that you could say that a lot of those of this knowledge, a lot of this these texts and also alchemy and Kabbalah, so they they were developed in Europe or in in the middle in, in the Mediterranean area, etc. Right, and nowadays, and that probably started in the late 19th century, and now it triggers me to that what you say. Um, this movement has very strongly moved over to North America, because um, well, it's not a, it's not a coincidence that 85 percent of my listeners are there. But also um, a lot of what is being produced in writing, in, in, in material, a lot of the groups that work still um, are based in North America. Um, where do you see the origin of that and where the reason of, for that? Oh, that is fascinating perspective. I think you're in a better position to you know, be able to make that kind of overview claim. So that's fascinating. I mean, I just see uh, so much coming out of America in terms of theosophy, even though it's not a major force anymore, Mm -hmm. you know, like (laughs) theosophy isn't dominating these discussions anymore. And yet when you go look at uh, so many people who were influential later, like what movement did they come out of? That oftentimes uh, is how it's nurtured. And that was an American product. And so that did come out of uh, Blavatsky being here. And uh, I might mention Randolph also, because Randolph, uh, another homegrown American occultist, was very influential on both Blavatsky and Crowley. And I see both their influence as kind of towering, you know, in terms of yeah. disseminating yeah. these these ideas. So. But you, you mentioned Crowley, but even Blavatsky, and then you can mention the Golden Dawn, etc., who which started up in England, uh, both Crowley and the Golden Dawn, so the Oto, I mean, and the Golden Dawn. But now their main their main footstep is North American, right? Uh, nowadays. And and many, uh, so is theosophy. Theosophy didn't originate in North America, but it became what it was in North America. Uh, so I find that interesting. I often thought maybe it's because um, spirituality in general is more present in, in today's North America than it is in Europe. Um, but maybe it's also a bit related to what you were talking about earlier about that uh, 19th century movement and how how did that originate? Where did that grow out of? Um, so, gosh, are, are you asking sort of where did um, the movements I've already been talking about, where they grew out yes, of? In terms yes, exactly. The, the literary movements, yeah. for example, where, where did those people like uh, Emerson or even Poe or where did they find their subjects. Well, why did they find your subjects? <laughs> yeah, so um, someone I put in the deck, William Ellery Channing, was a Unitarian. And so it, it sounds kind of dull. Why put a Unitarian uh, in the deck? But I think that he was one of the first people that started thinking beyond Christianity because it was sort of a straight jacket mm-hmm. 
in the early years of the nation. Right. Um, so I, my mind went in all these directions with the, the question that you're asking. I think probably to get more to the heart of it in terms of what makes American metaphysics or occultism unique. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the fact that everyone who's here has been uprooted, that that's the origin of all of us, whether we were displaced because we're indigenous and we got moved off our land or we were forced here by slavery or we emigrated. Um, everyone is, is experiencing this uprooting. And so I think that we're not as bound by tradition. And I think that's really like the common theme that ties together all American movements is experimentation because we're not reckoning with the past. So we don't even have like monuments to the past around us because we've moved from where we were before. So, yeah, that, that's how I would answer it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, because uh, it often struck me that and I, 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 I feel a, a path is a bit in there. You mentioned Poe several times, but I think um, Poe, um, who is a bit earlier actually than most of the others, and especially a bit earlier than the than the Big Five that you mentioned uh, before. Um, what role did Edgar Allan Poe play in in this whole movement? Uh, I'm of course also in your tarot, but uh, he came in your tarot because he played that role. Oh, I'm delighted you asked. Yes, I'm a huge Poe fan. Uh, so he was actually contemporaneous with the Big Five, but he died fairly young. He died fairly young, yes, sure. Yeah, he died at 40, 41, hmm. um, but he was born in 1809, so he was a peer to Emerson. Um, so how does he figure in? Well, he was a huge part of my academic research. Hmm. And so what I started to notice when I was researching transcendentalism is that it's connected to platonic idealism. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understood that Poe positioned himself against Emerson. He hated Emerson and made fun of him in print a lot. But this started to strike me as very odd because Poe has such a Neoplatonic perspective as well. So I wanted to unpack that, you know, like what made them so different. And that really just led me down uh, a road of comparing them. Uh, and finding that Poe was very much a hermeticist. And so it became this uh, question, like this <laughs> question I could never quite answer. How did Poe get exposed to hermeticism? Yes, and so yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and what what shows that he is hermetic? Maybe we can use Poe as a good example because he's the best known internationally among all those people, so to speak, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and what, what is... What shows the hermeticist in Poe for you? What, what, where does it show that he is one? Yeah, I mean, what I could do is kind of shoot right to the end of his life. So mm. he writes a cosmology called Eureka. Okay. And so I think that the way most people know Poe is that he writes these horror stories exactly. that are very suggestive and clever. And, and that's how we know him. But he writes something that's very earnest at the end of his life. It's his longest work. And he's attempting to reconcile uh, materialist science with spirituality. So this is an incredible undertaking. And I think that people who don't understand it assume that he's making a joke, that it's one of Poe's hoaxes. Uh, but in fact, he's quite sincere, as we know from his letters, the way he was talking about it at the time. And he said, since I wrote Eureka, I have no reason to live. Okay. That this was his final word. And so it was um, an attempt at a theory of everything. And I think the hermeticist aspect of it appears in the fact that he's essentially making the as above, so below argument. Okay. And he's um, dissolving. In, in, all Eureka, in, that, in that book, you mean? In, yes. In, in, yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's explicit here. Right. So mm -hmm. um, he's essentially saying uh, God is material because spirituality and uh, material reality exist on this continuum. Mm -hmm. And then I have a quote here from the text. He said, each soul is in part uh, its own God, its own creator. And this is the thesis he keeps coming back to, right? This creative power. Um, That's uh, very, very hermetic, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, the other thing that this text does, which is so interesting, is he really breaks down the difference between rational thought and intuitive thought. 
And he's essentially saying that all knowledge comes from God, which is also (laughs) very hermetic. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is a dissertation chapter where I'm just kind of point by point saying, you know, Poe's getting this from somewhere. I'm not sure if he had a copy of the Corpus Hermeticum. There are these other ways he could have seen it. He could have seen it through uh, Emerson reprinting portions of it in the dial uh, or through Cudworth or, you know, these other places that it appeared. Sure. But it was also quite diffuse in the 19th century where we have hermetic ideas, very widespread. Um, And so there's kind of like an infinite number of sources that he could have used. Or did he just come up with these things on his own? Uh, He writes about mesmerism quite a bit. (laughs) And in in one story, Mesmeric Revelation, which he referred to as an essay and not a story, It's about a patient who discourses on the afterlife uh, and it's about how uh, the human mind and the senses sort of split up knowledge. But then once you're released from your body, you have the pure knowledge of God. And so um, there's just a lot of interesting meditations on uh, turning off sensory input so that you can hear that higher yeah, mind so yeah. okay yeah that's very I mean, I, I, honestly eureka i wasn't aware of so i not need to read that but i found it very well funny actually that you put rufus griswold the author well one of the <laughs> enemies of edgar Allan poe who wrote that horrible piece on him or after his death that created all kinds of false rumors right about him yes. and you put him as the missionary <laughs> of swords just uh, just after the king of swords uh, um what motivated you to do that so this is actually uh, my nerdy self coming out of tarot history so um, i was reading about uh, the tarot in the medieval world and how the position of the knight was associated with the planet mars Mm. and then the suit of swords is also the marsy suit and so i was thinking of um, the knight of swords as the the mars of mars so really an aggressive evil character and so of course That's why we put Rufus Griswold, uh, Poe's nemesis, in that position. And, you know, again, I it's not a deck for spiritual reflection only. You can use it that way. But I also wanted it to be applicable to real life situations. And this is something that happens. We we get jealous of each other. We have enemies. So, yes. (laughs) So. Unfortunately, I have to ask a final question now because we are otherwise running out of time. But um, is this a tarot set that is for people who are knowledgeable or very much interested in American literature? Or is it a tarot set for everyone? Um, who, who, is your, who is your target? Hmm. Well, you know, this is my ego talking, but I think it's for everyone. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But <laughs> the, the target audience in my mind was maybe uh, English majors, you know, college students. Mm. But also, again, it's my goal was much bigger than that, in that I think that um, Americans are not very knowledgeable about their own history. Mm. And so I was hoping it it would be a way to um, start to interest Americans in their own metaphysical history. Um, And if you happen to know a lot about these characters, the feedback that I get from literary professionals is, I've learned so much that I didn't know. You've Mm. sort of like picked out all these scenarios from American history and literature that uh, are not as talked about, you know, or not the common narrative. So So good for you. Good for you. Well, Thea, thank you. Um, Unfortunately, we have to come to an end now, but um, this was fascinating. Thank you for your time and for uh, going also showing a lot about yourself and being being ready to do that. Thank you so much. Um, Maybe you have some final thing to say uh, that you would tell the audience before we say goodbye. Oh, it's so much pressure. Uh, no, oh, just, no, you don't get But just say <laughs> goodbye if that's it. <laughs> yes, it, was, it. It was a ball. It was really a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sia.
Feast Permanent by Joshua Kirich. Once again, Joshua is one of our listeners. He's a musician. He is a practitioner. He's studying via Korea at the moment and also some independent study. And he also likes to hear from the guests here to learn from that. And I think there are many like him out of you, out of you, out, many like him out there. Hmm. Well, okay, you, you know what I mean. <laughs> and and uh, that's nice because I think it's really worth listening to those guests here, uh, like Thea Wersching today, who have a lot to say. You can learn a lot from them. And I'm glad that when I hear from people like Joshua, not only for his music, which is splendid, and thank you for that, but also for letting us know that you enjoy the show and that you learn something from it because that's important and i sometimes tell you also well i do each time when i do an interview and that is true it's not not just empty words i learned also today a lot from thea and um, that's one of the reasons why i like the reviews podcasts okay well thanks everyone for being here today and for listening in thanks thea for being with us and sharing your knowledge and yes, there will be a next show next week, episode 13 of season 8. Wow, it's amazing. It comes to my mind now. This was episode 12, and uh, that means half a season is already through again, because those seasons, when they are full, not always the case, but when they are full, as it was the case last time, and all looks well that it will be so this time again, Oh. Uh, this will be the first episode of the second half of season eight. Okay. <laughs> and now it's getting complicated. Right. But who will be my guest on this new episode next week, on, which will be May the 22nd? And it's the return of somebody you really liked uh, last time when he was here. And keep liking because the, up, the download figures on the show that he did for us... Uh, bit over a year back it was um, on season six um, it they are still really really, really very high um, Mark Stavish I mentioned him when I talked about Kekobot Radio Mark Stavish is going to be back and um, we have the talk uh, which I'm going to play for you about getting how, how does a young student uh, start into this world what should you take be careful with what path should they take? How can you enter that world by finding your own path and finding out what's dangerous also, what you should not do, what you should do? And who else than Mark could talk better about that? So it's a really, really interesting talk. And not only for starters, I tell you, uh, we were talking about learning just a minute ago. I think each of us, even very seasoned practitioners, can learn a lot from that discussion that Mark and I had, and which we are going to present to you next week, next Sunday. Okay, well, that's the end of this week's episode. And once again, thank you for listening and thanks for coming back next week. Have a good week in between. Uh, take care of yourself. I hope the world is not too crazy in the part where you are and where it is. Um, we are all thinking of you. Okay, so take care, stay tuned, hear you soon.